Now that we covered the relevance of anamorphic faking and some cheap, easy options you can get on the market, along with a ton of streak flare information, it's time to get started on our own anamorphic fakes. As a first step, let's go over the list of tools you're likely to need and then have a quick word about what lenses are best fit for this process. The second part of this video is a deep dive into the math of designing your own oval inserts. If you're not in love with math, the intro of that section has the core of what you'll need and you can skip over the rest for now. The list of ingredients is quite comprehensive, so I'm only expanding on the essentials. As soon as you have those, you are good to start. The rest of the list just increases your possibilities, and if you wanna understand more of their uses, check the written anamorphic guide. Lens wrench. This is your most important tool. You're going to use it to take many things apart. Sandpaper, coarse. Spray paint, Sharpies. These allow you to tint your aperture and flares, as well as some lens pieces. You can get away with blue and orange for 95% of the cases. Double-sided tape. You thought there would be no tape on the list? <laughs> this will be useful to secure ovals in place, as well as hold flare lines down while you close your anamorphics. Masking tape. Scissors. You will be cutting many things. Fishing line, tapes, ovals. Fishing line multiple diameters. Oval cutouts. You can make your own based on this video or buy them at my store. Electrical tape. Caliper. A caliper will be useful for measuring and making your own oval aperture discs. Plus, anything related to 3D printing. Vector drawing software. I use Illustrator, but there are plenty of free options out there, such as Inkscape. All you need is to be able to draw the exact sizes in millimeters or inches. ND filters or variable NDs. Many of these mods will result in a scenario where you do not want to change your aperture. Because of that, NDs become key in controlling exposure. Cheap CPL filters, cheap UV filters, a good set of small screwdrivers. These are just as important as your lens wrench, except you can find them in any hardware store. Get something that has numbers double zero and triple zero sizes for Philips and JIS. Acetone, cotton pads, nitrile gloves. Always do all your anamorphic work with gloves. You want to avoid greasy fingerprints on the inside of your lenses, as well as avoid lens grease, Sharpie paint, spray paint, acetone burns, and metal polish on your bare skin. 3D printer, isopropyl alcohol, plus lens wipes. These two come together. They are the regular stuff you would use to clean your lenses, but now you'll be cleaning the inside elements too. Canned air. It's always a good measure to blast off any dust from inside the lenses before you close them up. Rotating M42 adapters. All Soviet lenses I modified were M42, and getting the oval plus flare alignment right in the first try is near impossible. These adapters will save you a lot of time while also transforming the M42 mount into whatever you need to attach your camera to, like EF or L mount. Hot air gun or soldering iron. This will be key to save you from stripped screws while disassembling lenses. You can also get rubber tubes for gripping elements that don't have notches and a suction tool for taking out elements without having to drop them onto your hand. Now, all you're missing are the lenses themselves. I know this is a long list. Still, even if you buy everything in there, it won't cost you very much. Minus the 3D printer, probably. Do all of your work in a clean, flat, and well-lit area without dust and other types of debris. As good measure, I like to photograph or record every step of the disassembly process so I can backtrack on it if I become unsure of where some part came from. I also learned through experience not to do any lens disassembling on the kitchen table or even my work table because I might get stuck in the middle of the process and all of a sudden I need that space for a different activity. So pieces get mixed together, dust falls everywhere, you lose track of which part went where, and so on. Make room and time 
for this endeavor. Otherwise, it can be quite unpleasant. It is not hard to notice the amount of mentions to the Gallius 44-2 in this series. It was the very first lens I modified. The Gallius packs many qualities that make it a great candidate for anamorphaking. It has a very simple build, not too many elements, it is super cheap and readily available. This combination by itself already lowers the stress bar for cracking it open. You will not be playing with some irreplaceable, ultra complex piece of gear. You will be experimenting on the AK47 of lenses. It can take a beating, be assembled all wrong, and it'll still work to some extent. You will see how the Gallius is super easy to take apart and put back together when watching my tutorials. On top of that, the Gallius 44 features one of the simplest and most effective optical designs, the double gauss. The double gauss design is used in several high quality, cheap and fast lenses around the 50mm focal length. If you have a 50mm f1.8, it is likely to be somewhat related to the double gauss design. These are some of the reasons the Gallius 44 is recommended as an entry lens for people who want to experiment with vintage optics and that's also why it is the first lens I recommend anamorphaking. While all lenses can be anamorphaked, I prefer to focus my efforts on the ones that show certain qualities that make the work easier. Minimize effort and maximize gain is the number one rule. The first one of these qualities is full manual control. No autofocus, no electronics. While camera controlled aperture and autofocus are great, they require the inside of the lenses to be crammed with chips, wires, and motors. This adds tons of steps and raises the risks of damage to the lenses while disassembling them. Plus, there's no way to know how the lens's chip will react to you jamming something inside of it like a virus. I'm talking about the oval insert. That leaves us mostly with vintage lenses, which is still great. You have a huge array to choose from and lower prices when compared to modern lenses. Electronics cost more after all. Cost is the next important quality. I try to avoid modifying expensive lenses. I know I will be heartbroken and never forgive myself if I mess up a thousand dollar lens. There are still thousands of cheap vintage lenses to pick from. If you want to modify an expensive set, I recommend taking it at a slow and careful pace. When working on your own anamorphics beyond this guide, I recommend starting with the cheapest lenses you can find. Try Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace in your area. I also look up if someone has already posted a disassembly guide for the lens I am trying to open, either on YouTube or photography forums. The first dozen lenses or so are learning experience. Aim to make you more comfortable with the process of disassembling lenses and making your own adjustments. Do not be afraid of modifying multiple copies of the same lens or doing the same mod over and over. There's always something we can improve or play with. It took me more than 10 Gallius 44-2 mods before I settled on the full process I show in the Extreme Mod tutorial. A lens's construction is also a key aspect when it comes to the modifying process. As you will see later on, many lenses have a quick access path to the aperture mechanism. If a lens allows you to easily take out all of the optical groups behind it or in front of the iris, this is a good candidate for anamorphaking. Some other lenses have each element on its own retaining ring and getting to the aperture grows into an endless list of steps, making it hard to remember the way back and keep track of which part goes where. Plus, if you need to go back in and make adjustments, the easier the process, the better. The last quality I take into account is the lens's character. This one should only come into play after you get acquainted with modding in general. Let's look at my choices for the lenses featured in this guide as examples of good candidates for anamorphaking. I love the look of Soviet glass, the low contrast, the hazing, the easy flares and other artifacts. So I felt it would be interesting to build on top of that. Plus they are dirt cheap. The contacts are much cleaner, but still have great character 
and can still be found for modest prices. The Rokinon slash Samyang are just everywhere these days, and their popularity could encourage people to move towards an anamorphic look. All sets are fairly simple to disassemble and deliver great results. This bit is when we dive into math. I am going to cover how to measure and make oval apertures for any lens you manage to open up. The next section will teach you the calculations for light loss, maximum use of the aperture area, and anamorphic stretch simulation. For the coming steps, we're gonna need the caliper, any lens you manage to open, I'm going to use the Semiang 35mm as an example, and a vector-based program such as Adobe Illustrator. When you get to the aperture, there are two things for you to measure with the caliper. The first one is the diameter of the aperture mechanism area. The second one is the diameter of the aperture itself, which is our base number for calculating the new f-stop of the lens after the modification. You can see highlights of these two areas in the Samyang right now. With these two numbers, go to your vector software of choice and create two concentric circles. Make sure to specify the size of each in millimeters or inches so they match the real world. The outer circle is going to be the size of the aperture mechanism diameter, one, 33.21 millimeters in this case, and the inner circle is sized as the aperture diameter, or two, 28.24 millimeters. So far so good, but nothing anamorphic about it. If you wanna take it easy, you can order oval inserts at my store by just sending in these two numbers and the desired squeeze factor for the oval shape. I can take care of the rest of the math. Select the inner circle and change its width without changing its height. On Illustrator, you have to disable the little chain link icon. The new width of the inner circle is a percentage of its full value, depending on the squeeze factor you want to emulate. One divided by 133 equals 0.75 times, or 75% of the width. One divided by 1.5 equals 0.67, or 67% and one over two equals 0.5 or 50%. I almost always go for a two time stretch, so the width will be half the height. This design will give you a disc that fits neatly over the aperture mechanism without unwanted movement. At the same time, the oval shape takes full advantage of the aperture's height, minimizing light loss to as little as possible. At this point, we're going deeper into the math rabbit hole of calculating light stops. Get your pad and pencil, or bounce now and come back for the next video. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. For those who stayed, First, we're going to calculate how the oval insert affects the lens's maximum f-stop. It is known that every time the aperture area is divided by square root of two, light transmission is divided by half, cutting down one stop of light. If you want a more detailed explanation, read it at Wikipedia. Square root of two equals roughly 1.4. So dividing our generic full aperture x by 1.4 gives us 0.7x. This means that every time we shrink the area of the aperture circle to 70% of its original size, we are cutting one stop of light. Now look at the percentages we are using for 1.33 and 1.5 ovals, 75% and 67%. They are pretty close to 70%. Isn't that a great coincidence? Based on this calculation, 1.33 and 1.5 times ovals cut roughly one stop of light, while a two times oval will cut two stops. Let's test our theory then. First, we'll calculate the area of the aperture when wide open. Then, the area for one and two stops darker. Then we'll compare those values to the oval cutout area in our disks. Continuing with the Semiang 35 as our example, let's calculate the full aperture area. 
The area of a circle is given by pi times radius squared. And we can make it more useful by remembering a circle is nothing but a special type of ellipse. That is the mathematical name for ovals. The formula for the area of an ellipse is pi times height radius times width radius. The radius is an important measurement when dealing with circles and ellipses. In case you can't remember, the radius of a circle is half of its diameter. For the semi-ang 35, that is 28.24 millimeters divided by 2, or 14.12 millimeters. The f1.4 area equals pi, or 3.14, times 14.12 squared, which is very close to 200, so I'm just going to round it up, and that gives us 628 millimeters square. The f2.0 area is 70% of those 628 millimeters squared, so that will be 439 millimeters square. And f2.8 area is half of 628 millimeters square, which gives us 314 millimeters square. Let's keep these numbers on the screen and start the math for the area of the oval cutouts. First, let's turn the full aperture into a 1.5 times oval by reducing its width to 67% of the original size. That means the width radius will be 14.12 times 0.67, which is 9.46 millimeters, ultimately reducing the full aperture area to 67% of its original value. The f-stop area with 1.5 times squeeze is pi, 3.14, times 14.12 for the vertical radius, and 9.46 for the horizontal radius, which gives us 420 square millimeters. If we compare this number with the one that we got for the f2 circle on the corner of the screen, it is safe to say a 1.5 times oval insert in an f1.4 lens will cut down one stop of light, turning it into an f2 lens when shooting wide open. This is true not just for this one lens, but to any lens. If your base lens is f4, it will turn it into f5.6. If it is f2.8, the new maximum aperture is going to be f4. While I demonstrated it for 1.5 times, one could say 1.33 is close enough to have the same effect. 75% is close enough to 70%. Math is magic. Let's just confirm this again with the math for a 2 times oval insert. First, we reduce the full width of the aperture to its half. Then, we multiply the numbers. The f-stop area with 2 times squeeze equals pi, or 3.14, the vertical radius of 14.12 times the horizontal radius, now halved, which is 7.06, and that equals 313 millimeters square. And when we compare this result to the circular aperture at f2.8, we're pretty much on point with it, meaning a two times oval insert cuts down two stops of light. The change in aperture shape and size affects resolution and depth of field. Since your vertical aperture is at least one stop faster than your horizontal aperture, you will end up with better image resolution and sharpness horizontally. The oval shape acts as a narrower f-stop horizontally, while vertically we still use the full aperture f-stop. Same applies for depth of field, shallower vertically and deeper horizontally but hardly to a point where you can actually notice the difference in resolution between the vertical and horizontal axes. This is particularly interesting because it is the exact opposite of what actual anamorphics do. When shooting with anamorphics, you have an increased vertical resolution and sharpness. This happens 
because anamorphics effectively squeeze more information in the horizontal axis. And this is the only time in this series I will bring up something that has to do with shooting with anamorphics. Consider it a sample of the anamorphic cookbook the other big series we're running on the channel and that you should check out. Now that we're done with all of the math and I proved A plus B, the effects of the oval inserts on light transmission, we can wrap up this episode. On the next one, we'll jump into modding lenses. I hope to see you there. Tschüss, du